cringing on stage here, but um, I always put Mike up first because I, you know, Mike and I go back. Mike was our first presenter. Mike and I met 24 years ago, um, and I at, at Boston University. Mike was doing. They had a seminar that Mike was speaking at in his weight room in De Niro, and there was something about the first time I heard him. Now again, Mike didn't have flip flops on at the time. Actually, that's I don't I today. What's no. going on? I'm gonna ride the bike after uh, practical. I want to get a workout in. I'll put them on. Most, uh, most. But that's what I really, really like about Mike. And Mike has come out here, uh, obviously. Mike, Mike has done more speeches for us in the last 20 plus years um, on multiple continents Europe, China, Asia, Japan, um, South America. Um, he's one of our most sought out speakers. For those who don't know Mike, um, MBSC in Massachusetts, Boston. Um, there's a couple of facilities, three facilities that Mike has up there. It's just, it's just, I always tell people. Thanks. So I'm really glad that's over. That is, that is the worst five minutes of the day for me, is sitting through the introduction. I realized last, well, two weeks ago we were in Long Beach, Chris? Chris um, redefined, he, he gave networking an entirely new definition when he was like networking and people got married and had kids. And I'm like, wow, that, would, that is not what I thought networking was. but. So I hope everyone has a really great time networking while they're here. God. It just was like one of those, I was like, I don't know if that's the best example of networking, but, but it works. Um, so core training. Um, that's what we're going to talk about, right? Um, before we talk about that, though, obviously, I, wanna, I do want to thank Chris. He really is one of my best friends in the world, and I really do love doing this. This is great. Like, you get to finish with a home game. I like the fact that Rhode Island is last, Chris, because... You can just drive down and drive back. I drove down this morning. It was easy. I was able to go by the gym and pick up some stuff that we forgot. So that was all great. I want to thank my staff because there's people there working and they'll be here later, but so that the rest of us can be here. So that's awesome. And I want to thank you guys. It's obviously great to, it's a lot more fun doing this when the room is full than when the room is empty. So that's good. Um, this is my contact info. That's my only email address. So it's not like that goes into some, you know, info box or something like that. That goes shows up on my phone if you send me an email. That's Twitter. If you tweet, you'll usually hear back from me. That's Instagram. If you, say, if you comment on Instagram, you may not always hear back from me because there's way more comments than there can be answers sometimes with Instagram. But, uh, but it's all up there. So I also, you know, if you have a question, email me. If you want a pen pal, like don't email me every day. I don't really want to hear from you. Like Chris is talking about we have to be nice and be approachable. I'm like, I'm all for that. But some people all of a sudden decide that like we have a great personal relationship because they got my email address. So like one or two questions is awesome. Daily emails, not so awesome. Um, we, we have lots of stuff, like Chris was saying, we have facilities. But this is like my, my favorite thing right now, strengthcoach.com, because every day we're answering questions. Every day, the, the cool thing about here, I don't know if Lee Taft is at this one, but I mean, there's so many people that come to these things that are experts that just voluntarily answer your questions. Uh, for really no good reason except that they're my friends, which is actually really cool too. Um, so that's awesome. And then Body by Boyle Online is literally like a performance library. I went and looked the other day, and this is an embarrassing thing to say, that I went and looked at the content the other day to see what was actually on there, and I could not believe how much stuff there was on there. Someone asked me about, you know, is this DVD on there? And I'm like, I don't really know what's on there, to be honest. And then I started looking and realizing that there's, I think there's, there's stuff going back maybe into the early 2000s that we've recorded. So almost everything that we've ever recorded, every staff meeting, every in-service that we've ever had, there's more content on Body by Boil Online than you could ever watch. We started figuring it out. If you just sat down and tried to watch, you know, one or two hours a day, you'd actually never catch up. We'd be able to get it on there faster than you could consume it. So it's pretty cool. 
Um, three big takeaways. So I'm always trying to get better at this whole thing, at this idea of being a presenter. And one of the books that I read said, you got to give everybody three takeaways. They've got to know right at the beginning what we're trying to get across here, right? So first one, breathing matters. We're going to talk a lot about breathing. We want you to learn about breathing. We want you to understand breathing. Two, and this is a big one, flexion and rotation are bad ideas when it comes to core training. For some of you, that may be like, if you're the, the, in the 50% that raised your hand like first time you've been here, you may be like, what is he talking about? Don't worry, we'll get to what I'm talking about. But flexion and rotation are not really, really good ideas. And then three, learn motor control. We're going to go downstairs when we're done here, and we're going to spend another hour and 15 minutes. And most of that hour and 15 minutes will be dedicated to motor control. Because really, when we talk about core training, what we're talking about is motor control. We're talking about this idea of, can I move my extremities without compensatory movements of my spine? So if we just think as we're going along, these are the three things that are going to be really, really important for us. So what do I want to do? I want to try to clear up some of the disagreements. Because the other thing you realize, well, one, with something like core training, I was thinking about this on the way down. It's amazing now. And you guys, are, everybody's in the industry. So you'll meet people all the time. Oh, it's all about core. Just so you know, that's bullshit. It's not all about core. You know, oh, you got to have a strong, I mean, no, that's, that's all, I mean, it's a piece of the puzzle. That's all it is. It's a piece of the puzzle, but we've got lots of experts positioning themselves at different spots. I mean, this is the way to do it the right way. This is the wrong way. We're going to go through right, wrong, but what we're really going to look for is highlight the similarities versus the differences so that when you start thinking about, okay, what am I doing for core training? You're going to realize, okay, these are the things I need to do. These are the things I shouldn't do anymore. Super simple, right? The other thing I want to give you, and I keep saying I got to change this slide, and then I never do because I never think about it after I'm done. Tomorrow you won't train anybody, probably. You'll probably be here listening to somebody else. The day after tomorrow, you also won't train anybody. So we really want to give you actionable information for Monday. If I do a good job today, and if we do a good job, because some of the staff will help me in the practical, in the hour and 15 minutes after that, hopefully you're going to go back and do some things differently on Monday. Hopefully you're going to go back and you're going to teach your clients some different exercises, and you might, or you might teach the same exercises differently. That's the real goal. If you get there and you make some changes, then we're doing what we need to do. The other thing I want you to think about, are you smart? Because if you look at this list, and I think I, I said this, I think I stole this from John Maxwell, but I'm not positive. Smart people change their mind. Smart people use simple language. Smart people talk less but say more. Smart people stay teachable. Smart people ask questions. I want you to ask yourself, are you smart? Will you be smarter at the end of the talk? Because I always say you only have two choices, right? You can either be stupid or stay stupid, right? And if you don't ask questions, if you sit here and don't understand and don't raise your hand, then that's a choice that you made. You decided, I'm, I'm going to stay stupid. I'm not like, I don't get embarrassed at all about raising my hand. I have no problem. If I come to talks, I usually try to sit where they can see me. And if I don't understand, I'm going to stick my hand up and say, explain that better, please. If I don't explain it well, I'd like you to stick your hand up and say, explain that better, please. Make me understand that, please. Because that's really, really important. Right? What we want you to think, this is Ron Ruska. If you've ever done anything, my man Michael Mullins down there, that's a good talk for you to take in. But... Postural Restoration Institute, Ruska, Ron Ruska, who founded the Postural Restoration Institute, one of the things that he said early on is see the similarities, not the differences. That was one of the reasons I kind of liked the PRI stuff right off the bat, because he said, use this information to make your existing program that you're comfortable with better. That's what we did. We brought Michael in actually five years ago, Mike, maybe? So about five years ago, we brought Michael in when the Postural Restoration Institute stuff first started kind of bubbling to the surface said, i got to find somebody in New England who understands this stuff who can explain it to us. Because I want to get smarter. I want to know. I don't want to be sitting there thinking, I don't even know what this is about. We brought Michael in, and this is what I wanted him to do, right? I wanted him to show me the similarities. And I wanted him to help us make our programming better. And it did that. We understood breathing better. There are things that we understood better when he left, and we were able to take those things and make our programming better. That's what I want you to be able to do. Cheat. That is the key word here. And I say the same thing every time I do these talks. When I start Mike Boyle University, first class will be cheating. Right? Because in school, what do they tell you, right? Don't cheat. You know, look, look at your own paper. 
do your own work. Then when you get out, what do they tell you? Oh, then like at Chris, we're networking. I'm talking about real networking, not the kind Chris was talking about, but where you're actually talking to people, trying to learn stuff, right? They tell you, you know, get out, network, meet other people. You've got to be able to work as a team. You've got to be able to work as a group. I just feel, well, let's start right in the beginning. First class, figure out who the smart person is. I'm going to let you copy all this stuff. Because I'd be teaching you how to be successful. I don't care what industry you go in. If you are simply smart enough to steal good stuff, you'll do really, really well. Why is Sue's book up there? Sue's talking downstairs. She's mad at me right now. But Sue's book is awesome. Chapter 8 on breathing is worth the price of Sue's book. So if Sue's book is downstairs and you want a really good book to read, you buy Sue's book. That way you get to steal my stuff now, and then you get to steal Sue's stuff, even though you didn't get to hear her speak. So double cheating, right? But this is what we talked about with Monday. Don't let your learning need, lead to knowledge. Let your learning lead to action. So if you learn stuff today, and then you don't put it into action, guess what? You wasted an hour and 15 minutes this morning. Don't waste an hour and 15 minutes. Don't sit here for an hour and 15 minutes and then be like, oh yeah, yeah, well, yep, that's great, yep, learn that, okay, and then go back and do the same thing that you did before. And two years ago was the uh, Start With Why seminar. Almost everybody had this book in their presentation. I'm keeping it in mind this year. Because what we want to think about and what we're going to talk, we're going to spend probably the first 40 minutes of this talk talking about why. Why are we doing what we're doing? Then we might talk a little bit about how we're going to do it. And then lastly, we're going to talk about what we're going to do. When we get down to the practical, we'll, it, practical will be all what? This is what we do. But if you don't understand, if you, and this is why it's always tough when you get people who don't like to come to the lectures and come to the practical, we'll get down to the practical. Half of the people will not have been in the lecture. And they won't really understand the why. They won't get why we're showing you exercises the way that we're showing you exercises. You can tell I, I, I like books, right? This is, a, this is an amazing book. And this, neither Start With Why or Think Like a Freak has anything to do with fitness, but I would tell you that everybody should read Start With Why and everybody should read Think Like a Freak. Because in Think Like a Freak on page 8, they say, the conventional wisdom is often wrong, and a blithe acceptance of it can lead to sloppy, wasteful, or even dangerous outcomes. I am 100% certain that is true. If I was training people, if I was doing you know, core training the way that I did it 20 years ago, I would be negligent. I was negligent then. I just didn't know I was negligent, so it's different. This is also important. Thomas Myers is not here this year, but one year when Thomas Myers talked, he said 50% of what I'm about to tell you was wrong. Unfortunately, I don't know what 50% that is. And I would say the same thing. If I'm up here five years from now, I might be apologizing again. Sorry, I was wrong about that. I always believe I'm right until the moment I know I'm wrong. <laughs> That's just the way that it works, right? And you should, if you thought you were wrong, then you should be changing. And that's the important part about what we're talking about. If you think, okay, we're doing that and that's not a good idea, stop. It's easy. This is also really important. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it. One thing you need to know if you are a, probably, how many people here are personal trainers? How many people, or that's some portion of their business, exactly, right? Just so you know, your clients don't give a shit about anatomy. Not one shit. So don't bother trying to, to impress them with anatomical terms and words. And, you know, I, I treat my clients like they're really stupid. And my clients are generally pretty smart, but I don't treat them that way. I want you to breathe in through your nose. And I always tell them, breathe in through your nose like you're a 12 year old sucking snots back in. They get that. Like, if you've been around a 12 year old that you want them to blow their nose, but they don't want to, and they're like, no, I'm fine. And then you can like hear stuff rattling around in their head, okay? That's how I want you to breathe through your nose. And then I tell them, blow out, blow out your mouth like you're blowing out birthday candles. It doesn't have to be intelligent. They don't need to know what their diaphragm is doing. They don't need to understand their zone of apposition. Not only do they not need to understand, they don't care. They could care less. They just want to exercise. We care. But to be a really good coach, you've got to realize that they don't. Explain it simply. Because any fool can make something complicated. It takes a genius to make it simple. That's the key. Can you make somebody understand, this is what I want you to do? And they go, oh, yeah, that's easy. Or do you stand there and talk like some guy who's trying to impress him with his, as Greg Cook says, with his Latin knowledge, you know, rattling off all these muscle names for them. And they're like, yeah, whatever. 
Can we just work out? I'm tired of listening to you. Try to tell me how smart you are. I don't care, right? And the one thing I will tell you, this is just a segue, usually the people who are really trying to tell you how smart they are are also generally complaining about not having enough clients. That might tell you something. They're generally not a lot of fun to be around. <laughs> in our business, okay, people need to want to pay to spend an hour with you. If you are pain in the ass, they probably won't want to pay for an hour, right? But should we do what we've always done? This is another, right? Can you see the theme here? Books, creating magic. This one's about um, Lee Cockrell. Lee Cockrell was, went from being an army cook to being the executive director of Disney World. It's a pretty good rise. But the interesting thing, the, the part that this book comes from, what if the way we always did it was wrong? He comes home to his wife with his head bandaged. And his wife looks at him and says, what happened? And he says, a waiter broke a bottle over my head. His wife's response is, that is the second time this month that a waiter has broken a bottle over your head. Do you think that you might need to change your military approach with your staff at the restaurant? Because what if the way you always did it was wrong? But it's a perfect example, right? Like there's so many of us think like, you know, we're going to coach like our coaches coached us. The last coach that coached me was like 1976. It was a couple of years ago. We probably can't coach that way anymore. But this is the perfect example. What if the way we always did it was wrong? And World War II, and this example is also in the book. The, uh, we were firing shells every minute. Germans are firing shells every 30 seconds. All of us can do math. Germans are firing twice as many shells as we are. A, a general goes to the colonel and says, okay, you need to figure out why can they fire every 30 seconds, we fire every minute. The guy comes back and said, because it's in the manual, it says right here, fire the shell, wait 60 seconds. And the general's response is, that's not acceptable go back and do some more research. So the guy goes back and he pulls out the World War I manual, opens it up, says the exact same thing. Fire the cannon, wait 60 seconds. He comes back to the general again, and he's like, look, it says right here. I have no idea, but it says wait 60 seconds. And the general's like, not an acceptable answer. The guy goes back to the Civil War manual. He opens up the Civil War manual, and in the Civil War manual, it says, fire the cannon and wait 60 seconds to steady the horses. Okay. That's the perfect example of this what if the way we always did it was wrong thing. And we do that in fitness, we do that a lot. And I could, I could do a whole presentation on all the things that we tell people. You know, I love people, you know, you got to get rid of the lactic acid. Well, just so you know that, they blew that idea out of the water about 10 years ago, right? You know, heart, maximum heart rate, 220 minus your age. They blew that one out of the water about 20 years ago. Okay, but we just keep repeating stuff over and over again because someone told us a long time ago that it was true. The one thing I will tell you, if you say something is true often enough, people will start to believe it's true. Particularly in this social media era, it'll go even faster. Right? This was us in the 70s. And I'm not even kidding. This, we were doing, I mean, that's not a 70s picture, but we were doing stuff like that. And I can show you my like 80s workouts. It just said abs times 100 at the end. And you could basically do any bullshit you wanted to, you know, bicycle crunches or toe ups or leg raises or whatever shit you wanted to do. As long as you did 100, you were good. And if you got really sore, you were really good. That was how intricately I understood, I understood core at that particular point in time. And, I, and I'm not kidding when I say, you know, we had sit-up boards, right? And we hooked our feet under sit-up boards and we held plates behind our head. Like, we did a lot of really moronic stuff that probably contributed more to back pain than it did help us, right? But when we start talking about core, we got to look at this idea. Well, what is it? Because this, I think, this is a legitimate question. What's the core? When we start talking about trying to define this, what is it? Where is it, right? So if we look, people would say, oh, that's it. Maybe. You know, rectus abdominis, external oblique, transverse abdominis, internal oblique. That's part of it, right? But if we go through it, backside, multifidus, I'd say that's part of it. Quadratus lumborum, yep, I'd say that's part of it. For me, glute medius, hip muscles, part of it. And this is where, again, and if you go to Michael's talk, diaphragm, part of it. I can remember before Michael came in, Sue Falsoni, as I said, who's talking downstairs, but... Her lecture is later, so if you do get a chance to hear her lecture go, she's doing her hands-on first, doing her lecture later. But I can remember Sue coming into our facility, 
and getting up on stage. And if you've ever seen Sue talk, she's just like super bubbly and excited. And she's like, I want to talk about my favorite muscle. And I'm kind of looking like, well, this will be interesting. She's like, the diaphragm. And I remember sitting right where this guy was and thinking, is the diaphragm a muscle? Like that was the first thing that came into my head. Is the diaphragm a muscle? And I had to literally, like I'm on my computer and I'm kind of looking, I'm literally like Googling is the diaphragm a muscle as I'm listening to Sue talk. But I think about how far my knowledge has come since that period six years ago. Now I realize that from a core training standpoint, yeah, it's a muscle. And yet it's a really important muscle. Okay, so we've got to start learning. And the bad part, and this is where the PRI stuff comes in, it's an asymmetrical muscle. And we're asymmetrical people. Like again, this is when, I, when Michael first came to talk, one of the things that stuck out to me most, because we'd spent all this time thinking about symmetry. You know, we're going to work on symmetry. We want to be symmetrical. And then he was like, we're not symmetrical. We're never going to be symmetrical. You can't move your heart, right? You just can't. It's going to be on one side. And that means your diaphragm is going to be a little bit too dome shaped. Like that's the way that it is. We just have to figure out how we control that as opposed to how we try to get symmetrical. But then here, do you think this is part of the core? I do. All of our adductors, because those adductors are acting on the hip. They're helping us flex the hip. They're helping us adduct, right? So as iliac is absolutely positively part of the core. Deep hip flexors. So what we got to realize is we've got a pretty big, complicated system that we're talking about, right? Then we have to define, OK, what's What's the core? Like to me, a deliberately constrained transfer system or station. And the important words, and this is why I made this definition up. Because what I want you to understand with the core, deliberately constrained. I think that's the most important feature when we start talking about the core. There's a reason I can't do the exorcist thing, right? If you said to me, Mike, look behind you, I would need to turn around because I cannot spin my head 360 degrees. The system's made that way. I have a certain amount of lumbar rotation. The system's made that way. I have a certain amount of thoracic rotation. The system is made that way. It's funny, because for a long time, we got into like the, I don't know, like the touchy-feely, free-flowing stuff. Like, oh yeah, you know, the spine's supposed to be able to move, and you know, it should be free to move. That's bullshit. It's not supposed to be free to move at all. It's deliberately constrained. It's designed and poorly designed for us to walk upright. Understand that part, poorly designed. When we decided to get off our hands and stand up, we compromised things. And it's the reason we have back pain. It's the reason we have disc problems. We're not made to be bipeds. When we get up off the ground, we made some compromises. And some of those compromises were vertebrae changed in size. The bones of the, the, bones of the body are amazingly adaptive. There's something called Wolf's Law of Bone. I love Wolf's Law of Bone as an example. If you have somebody, and they've done this, if somebody fractures their tibia, they've actually had some people where the tibia was so badly fractured that the only thing they could do was take their fibula, transplant it, because fibula is a non-weight bearing bone, put it in where the tibia was. Do you know what the fibula looks like at the end of two years? A tibia. <laughs> That's Wolf's lower bone, because when you start weight bearing on that bone, the bone changes. So what we've got to realize, all this stuff, we're, we're deliberately developed a certain way, and we don't want to be messing with that. It's like back to the old commercial, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature, right? So what's core stability? I think core stability is the ability to move your upper extremities of your, or your hips without compensatory movement of your spine. So can I move my arms, can I move my legs without having to substitute spinal movement? That's really, really important. Some people, if you listen to Greg Cook, he might call that motor control. I think when we start talking about core stability and motor control, at least as it applies to this segment, they're pretty much the same thing, right? So what are we going to try to do? We're going to try to take the work of people like Paul Hodges, Stuart McGill, Shirley Sarman, James Porterfield, Carl DeRosa, Ron Rusk, and Philip Peach. We're going to try to make it into some kind of user friendly idea so that we can say, this is what I think you should do for core training. All I did, what I want you to understand, I am not an expert. You know what I am? I'm an expert thief. I am really good at stealing other people's shit and making it simple and easy to understand. That's, if I have a strength in this world, that's it. So all I'm doing is interpreting all this stuff that I read 
and saying, okay, this is what makes sense to me. This is what I'm thinking about when we're going to train an athlete, when we're going to do it based on what I know right now. This is really important. And I might be doing this a little myself, so be, of, be careful with me too. But be careful with people who tell you the experts are wrong. This is an internet phenomenon that is, I would say, fairly recent, but I will say within the last 10 years. Because I love when someone, I love when I read some guy's tweet who's 26 years old and he says something like, I disagree with McGill. And I'm like, yes, in your infinite wisdom, you're disagreeing with someone who spent his entire life studying the spine because you read one freaking article, right? And more often than not, they disagree because it's like, I like the exercise that he said not to do. Therefore, I disagree with him. So be really careful when these sort of, because the other thing you realize with the internet, there's a ton of pseudo experts out there. It is so easy right now, the way the internet is. If, you, if I just decided that, you know, I'm going to make Sean the expert in the world on left-handed baseball pitching, I would guarantee you within one year I could have people saying, Sean is the expert in the world on left-handed baseball pitching. Because I would tweet it out so many times, Sean, the expert on left-handed baseball pitching. Sean, expert on left-handed baseball pitching. Eventually someone would start retweeting and saying, want to know about left-handed baseball pitching? Talk to Sean. And it happens all the time. I always said, one of these years, right, because I'm going to be 60 this year, one of these years, I, my wife says I'm already that guy, but... I'm going to become like the angry old man and I'm just going to start naming names. I'm going to be like, no more of this dancing around and talking about people that I don't like but not saying their names. I'm just going to be like, nope, that's this guy. <laughs> I'm not there yet. I'm getting closer every day, but I'm not quite there yet. But my point is that you just have to be really wary of people who suddenly show up one day and claim to be experts. One of the things you should ask is, hey, what makes you an expert? Stuart McGill, you know what makes you an expert? his whole life in a lab studying spines. I had one guy say, oh, you only studied pig spines. I'm like, we couldn't get a lot of human volunteers <laughs> to blow up their discs. Sorry, so he studied the next. But, you, but it's like, this is what some guy writes on the friggin' internet. He just looked at pig spines. They're not the same. I'm like, I get it. But you just can't be like, hey, by the way, I'd like to blow up some discs. Do we have any volunteers? Because what we're going to do is we're going to have you do crunches until your discs ex explode. Anybody in? When you look at lunatics, Hodges was enough of a lunatic. Read his book. Study, N equals 1. You know who the one idiot was in his study? Him. He like deep-needled EMG, his own transverse abdominus or something. He said, I could only get one person to do it. Me. The only, it was only one person that would let me stab themselves through their abdomen and get into that muscle. So it's kind of hard to do research and to be that expert when you're trying to like, do stuff to people that might hurt a lot and or get them hurt. Rehab or training, this is really important. You've got to understand, what are you doing? What happened to us, and what did this happen to me? Probably happened to lots of you, is we listen to somebody who does primarily rehab, and then next thing we know, we're treating our healthy clients like they're hurt. Okay, so we have to figure out, okay, how much core training do I want to do? How much core training do I need to do? Is this client hurt or healthy? And I don't want to be rehabilitating someone who doesn't have anything wrong with them. So just think about that a little bit. Like for us, our two-day programs don't contain that much core work because we got a lot of other stuff we got to get done in two-day programs. We can't spend, you know, if I got healthy people, I'm not going to spend a half a session doing core work. I'm going to spend a session doing the stuff that needs to get done. So you got to be thinking about that all the time. Let's talk a little bit about history. Like I said, this was, this was actually probably 50s, this picture, but this was not 50s, okay? This was 90s. Maybe even 2000s. Trisha might have been working for us in the 2000s. But, I mean, in the 2000s, we were probably still doing abs. We were probably still doing sit-ups and straight leg sit-ups and reverse crunches and crunches. And we were doing stuff in the last 20 years that we don't do anymore. Lots, right? Then we went, this was middle 2000s, what I would call the silly core period where we get really fascinated with stability balls and like everything had to be done on a stability ball and that made it better and we made up all kinds of stupid exercises that involved stability balls and probably lots of other dumb ideas. We stood on them, we did Russian twists on them, we just did all kinds of stupid stuff and it was very much like, well, some, I saw some other idiot doing it and I copied him. That was me. I saw some other idiot do it and I copied him. Didn't turn out to be that great an idea. 
I actually can tell you, I could stand on a stability ball at one point in my career. And then at another point in my career, I had two badly sprained wrists from not being able to stand on the stability ball as well as I thought I could. <laughs> Which is really tough to do when you've got a group of guys and you have to walk, you walk in the office like this. You're like, just going to go in there for a minute and, and compose myself and then come back out and try to pretend I didn't really badly injure myself a little while ago, right? Stupid. But we still see stupid. Like, it's crazy. That's why I love the internet for that fact. I mean, if you want to, if you want to know how to say, I always said this, the great thing about, you know what the best thing about our field is? It's absolutely littered with idiots. It's like, it's, they're everywhere. Like, it's so easy to be good at this. I said, it's like, you know, in the shallow pool, the midget stands out. You don't have to be really good. You don't. You just, you just got to be like, just be a little better than average. Don't be a moron and don't hurt anybody. And people will be like, oh, he's a really good trainer. He's not a complete idiot and he doesn't get anybody hurt. And you're like, that puts you in like the top 20%, which is nice. It makes it a lot easier, right? Then we went to the drawing phase. This was uh, the NASM period, if anybody ever took the NASM cert, where everything was like, first, first perform a drawing and maneuver. You can literally read the whole book. The whole NASM book and every exercise will have the same first line. First perform a drawing in maneuver. And that was all based on the Hodges stuff. That was based on Hodges' research on himself. But again, I, like, I don't fault Hodges because before he started doing it, I didn't even know what transverse abdominus was. I can remember someone asking me, like, what do you do for transverse abdominus? And I was like, I don't even know what that is. I had to go back and get my anatomy book out and look it up and I realized in my Gray's Anatomy that I think I got in 1976 in college, it was called transverse alice, and I looked, it got seven words, seven total words describing transverse abdominus in 1976 Gray's Anatomy. And then by the time uh, Hodges' book came out, there were a whole books basically devoted to this. So we learned a lot. I don't know if we learned enough, but we learned a lot, right? Then this guy comes along. To me, this guy was, he was the game changer. I remember being in a lecture like this, sitting in the front, and I, I'm looking at Shane nodding her head, and I'm like, I was sitting in the front, nodding my head like, okay, I'm an idiot. All right, I got to go home and change a lot of things. Okay, this guy knows way more than me. The cool thing about being around someone like Stuart, and it, you should have that feeling a lot when you're here. If you meet somebody smarter than you, the first thing to think about is, how do I steal their shit? First thing, like, how do I steal as much as I possibly can from this person? Don't be, like, offended. Don't be mad. Just be thinking like a burglar. Okay, how much of this can I steal? And how much of it can I use tomorrow? Because, you know, it's amazing. I would always have people say to me, you know, when you go back, do your clients ever get mad? I'm like, no, never. I've never had one client be like, oh, you're, oh, you're off getting better. I'd like to stay here and suck like we did last year and get hurt. No, like no one says that. No one gets offended. So if you're offended by swearing, you can leave like Chris said, because I'm not going to stop. Um, but like recognize, okay, he's smarter than me. And I realize he's smarter than me. He spent his whole life just studying spines. Probably has a reasonable idea what he's talking about. And this is my point. You don't have to be that smart to look at this guy and think, well, all he's ever done is study spines, and he's starting to say, like, okay, maybe these things that we've been doing a lot of aren't really that good an idea. But again, I get people like, oh, we still do crunches. I'm like, go ahead. Fine with me. More business for us, right? I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not worrying about ruling the world. Just making a living, right? Now, where are we? The breath phase. Everything's about breathing. It's amazing now. But I think this is really, really important, right? This was, you know, PRI and yoga people all of a sudden started talking about breathing and how important breathing was. And again, a bunch of us, I... Um, oh, wait, hold on. Oh, never mind. Somewhere in here there's a slide that says yoga apology, right? Geraldine, I saw you come in, but... Um, because I, I used to laugh at all the yoga people when they were like, you have to teach your clients to breathe. And again, I was a moron. Okay, I'm the first one to admit it. I cannot tell you how, when it, when, how many people I told in the 2000s when they said, oh, you got to teach your clients how to breathe, and I had the same answer. All of them breathe. 
Every last person who walks into the gym is breathing. I don't need to teach anybody how to breathe. I have no dead clients, none. Thank God, right? But none of them, they're all breathing. But that was stupid. I was stupid. I thought I knew way more than I knew. And then, as I said, I start listening to guys like Michael talk about breathing and how important breathing is. And I'm like, oh, sorry, yoga people, because I made fun of you all those times. I apologize. I don't apologize about the twisting stuff, but I'll apologize about the breathing part. I won't apologize because you got your certification off the back of a matchbook or something, but I'll apologize because I was wrong about the breathing thing. Um, so, and this should pop up. This really helped me. But let's see, it should run on its own, but maybe it won't. The primary muscle of respiration is the Okay. This was one of those things where, I, like I said, as I'm listening to Sue lecture, this is what I came up with because I'm, I'm trying to listen to her lecture and I'm trying to figure out what is she talking about. And I find that video and I'm like, oh, I get it now. And, and I'm, this, I'm, like I said, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I was like, okay, there's really a muscle that's responsible, responsible for breathing. I didn't know that. I will openly admit that I didn't, I didn't really, because again, as a strength and conditioning coach, one of the things I was certain of was that everyone, most of the time, everyone was breathing hard. I wasn't worried about them not breathing. They were all like, <gasps> it's like, we do that really good. I don't have to worry about that. Again, wrong. Completely wrong, and way more wrong when your clients get older. This, that's what I found really interesting as I started, because people used to always say, you know, you need to check your client's breathing, and I would be like, how do we check somebody's breathing? What do we do? to figure out if someone's breathing right. <laughs> now, you know, this again, in my infinite wisdom, maybe I'll ask them to breathe and see what they do. So what I did is I told them what I wanted them to do, breathe in through their nose and exhale out their mouth. And I remember I had one of my doctor clients, he's, he's 70 now, but so he was probably 64, 65 when we first tried it. I said, here's what I want you to do. He's lying on his back, I had you know, his hands on his stomach. I said, I want you to, to take a deep inhale through your nose, and I want like your ribs to come up a little bit at the bottom and I want you to kind of fill your stomach up a little bit and then I want you to blow out hard out your mouth. <sighs> like you're blowing out candles. And he looked at me and he went like this. <gasps> and I was like, uh, no, that was not it. And then I was like, oh, I know how to check breathing. That's so cool. Like I just figured out how to do it. If you ask somebody to do it right and they do it completely wrong, then they're not very good at it. And again, you're laughing, right? But that's how hard it is. He was literally, and then I was like, he's like, oh, I can breathe. Look, look. And I'm like, um, no, that was like your mouth and your shoulders went up in the air. That is not what I wanted to have happen. And then I realized he's one of these guys who's always complaining about his neck, right? And then I start thinking, oh, I understand how these breathing muscles are supposed to work. And then I understand that things like scalenes and sternocleidomastoid and upper trap are what we'd call accessory breathing muscles. And then I realized this guy, well, he's really good at using his accessory breathing muscles, which is probably why he has neck pain all the time, because he's doing this. He's pumping up here when he's supposed to be pumping down here. Like, that's the simple stuff that we figure out, right? Oh, so sorry. So this is all you got to know. Inhale. Diaphragm contracts concentrically when you inhale. That diaphragm is flattening out. Exhale. This is really important. This is another piece of the puzzle I was missing. Exhale, deep abdominals assist with late stage exhalation, right? So if you go to this article, and this, and I think Michael brought this, I'm not sure, Michael, I'm probably, I'm probably butchering anything that might actually be in your talk, so you guys should go and listen to Michael, because he actually knows more about this than me, and it's a little bit embarrassing that I'm presenting it while he's here, I'll have to ask him afterwards, I'll be like, how bad did I torture these people? And then he'll be really nice and say, no, it was pretty good. Whether it was bad or not, he'll say the same thing, which is very kind of him, but it is, I love this exercise, value of blowing up a balloon. And all they really ask somebody to do is to try to blow up a balloon 
while seated without using their hands. And the whole idea is it's going to teach you about breathing. Because if you think about what you have to do, if I asked you right now to put a balloon in your mouth and blow it up, can't use your hands, you'd figure out one, okay, I blew into the balloon. That was a start. Now you're like, now what do I got to do? Well, I can't let the air come back out of the balloon. I know that much. So I'm going to end up capping the balloon off with my tongue, right? Then, because I did that, I can't breathe in through my mouth again. So I'm going to have to breathe in through my nose. And then I got to get another breath in. And then the balloon's going to get bigger and bigger. And the more I do that, the more I'm going to figure out how much my deep abdominal musculature is involved in this end stage exhalation. Because by the time I'm done, my deep abdominal muscles are going to be really fatigued. And I'm going to have been breathing in through my nose and exhaling out through my mouth. Right? Uh, I already said that. Watch this. This is Franco Colombo. If, if anybody knows anything about old time bodybuilding strongman, he's blowing up, watch, a hot water bottle, not a balloon. Watch his rib cage in this next sequence. Okay, you don't think there's some muscles involved in expiration? Most people can't break a balloon. He can break a hot water bottle. But you just, when you see the expansion and contraction of his ribs and his abdomen, you start to realize, hmm, something going on here, kids, right? But think about this. We knew it already. Martial arts, they always talked about chi, and they were always kind of like, it's like, it's like here, right? They knew about core. They didn't have the same word for core, but they knew about core in, in ancient martial arts, right? If you ever take judo, if you've ever taken a judo lesson, the first thing they teach you is what they call ki-ai. Ki-ai is break fall. Both of my kids took judo. They teach you how to fall first, and when you fall, what they ask you to do is yell. Boom, hit the ground hard, ki-ai. Why? Because they know that that yell, that exhalation is going to turn on your stabilizers, right? I don't know if some ancient judo guy knew anything about core stabilization or he just knew that, you know something, when you make that sound, you're way tighter, you're way stiffer, you don't feel as bad when you hit the ground. But we knew it. Same thing if you ever watched, like a, I, we had RKC people come in one time and do a kettlebell demonstration and I can remember being so put off by the breathing. They were literally like, <laughs> like, uh, I was like, do we need the sound effects? <laughs> but then I realized later, I'm like, yes, we did need the sound effects, actually. If you want to do lots of swings and you want to be stable, the sound effects help you. I'm still not a sound effect person, but I get the point, right? So why don't all these people agree, though? Why are there, why are there so many different opinions when it comes to core training? My feeling is I don't know if they want to agree. I think it's hard to have a course, it's hard to do a lecture, it's hard to get people interested if everybody gets up here and agrees on the same thing. That's going to be difficult to do, right? Or do we just spend a lot of time debating the minutia? I have a friend who calls it picking the fly shit out of the pepper, right? There's a lot of people who like to spend time picking the fly shit out of the pepper. We're going to try to not worry about the minutia, we're going to try to worry about the big stuff. Is it possible that there is no one way? Maybe there isn't a, a right way to do this. Maybe there's a bunch of right ways, I'm not sure, right? Or do we focus, and this is the Ron Ruska thing, do we focus too much on the differences and too little on the common denominators? I'm going to try to get this focused in on the common denominators. Say, these are the things that I think make sense. These are the things that I think we should be doing. But this is what's important. 50 billion with a B. That's a pretty big market. 650,000 surgical procedures cost exceeding $20 billion. So if you start to figure out the core thing, and you start to figure out how to deal with people with back pain, there's a huge amount of money in play. So from a personal training standpoint, if you can do well with clients with back pain, you may never need to do anything else, actually, right? But this is what's important. And again, for those pain science geeks out there, I get that there might be the 1% exception. But basically, Stanley Paris, father of physical therapy, who I think recently just passed away finally, um, pain never precedes dysfunction. That's important to understand. Pain never precedes dysfunction. 
When someone comes into you and says, I have back pain, that will mean in 99.9% .9 of the cases, they have some level of dysfunction. If you can solve the dysfunction, you can make the pain go away, particularly if you catch it early enough. Two types, extension-related back pain, flexion-related back pain. That's kind of the easiest way to look at it. Extension-related back pain is going to be people like gymnasts, divers, figure skaters, weightlifters, baseball pitchers. That's where you'll see your, your spondylolisthesis kind of stuff, right? Flexion-related is more our wheelhouse in general if we're personal trainers. That's people who sit too much, people who are flexed too much, people who commute too much. So desk workers, right? Those are, and that's us sadly, whether we like it or not, right? So basically, we have two problems, lumbar flexion for hip flexion. So again, or I'm not going to this videos anyway, lumbar extension for hip extension. This is lumbar extension for hip extension. I'm always amazed at how often I watch people do an exercise that looks like this. And very, very often, I'll watch it. And when I ask somebody what they're doing, they'll generally tell me they're doing an exercise that someone showed them for their low back. And I will almost always think they are doing an exercise that someone showed them for their low back wrong. <laughs> because they don't have, so that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today, motor control. How do I get that person to move their hip without moving their spine? That's what's going to be important, whether it's in quadruped, whether it's bridging, whatever it is. How can I get them to be able to move their hip? Because in the same way, watch here, right? That, you know, Tricia, obviously, really good athlete. She was in three Olympics. but. She has a really perfectly clean hip flexion pattern. She can flex her hip without any compensatory movement of her spine. The average person is going to do that. It's amazing. I've said, you can watch people warm up, and I can decide whether or not they're back bothered. If I see somebody warming up and they're like, I'm like that person's back is going to hurt because they substitute lumbar flexion for hip flexion. They don't have enough hip mobility. And hip mobility is a, um, actually, I should have put, there's a really good PRI slide. Hip mobility is an interesting thing because the other thing we've done is we've run off too far in the mobility direction. Hip mobility is something that you need the right amount of. And too much is just as bad as too little. So we've got to be able to look at this and think, this is why, again, why I'm not necessarily a yoga fan all the time because you know, we don't want hypermobile people, actually. The worst people to try to help are hypermobile people. The easiest people to try to help are people who are really stiff and tight. Because they're people that'll respond to foam rolling, and they're people that'll respond to stretching, and they're people that will respond to strengthening and get better. The hypermobile person may not respond to any of those things very well, except strengthening. So when you think like figure skaters, dancers, gymnasts are the hardest people to help feel better. Because you can't just make them move better. They already move too much. Um, but if we look at those two things, what do we see if we think about FMS? Hurdle step, rotary stability test. You start to realize common denominators. Why did Gray pick these things? Because they're really important. That's why they picked them. So it's really important to look at that stuff. What does that person's hip flexion pattern look like? What does that person's rotary stability look like? Those are going to be really important when we start looking at back pain. Right? So assess and evaluate. Here's my assessment. Brilliant. Does that hurt? You get to say yes or no. Now, I have to spend a lot of time on my assessment because I will say to people, you get to say only yes or no. Anything like, well, not really, or, you know, after I warm up, or those are all yes. And you have to explain that to your clients. So that's all yes. Then you have to realize that your clients are all dumb liars, OK? Because they just want to work out. So how many clients have you had? Does that hurt? Nope, doesn't hurt at all, right? Then they walk away, and they're like, Ugh. and you're like, I thought you said that didn't hurt. And they're like, oh, it, like, it didn't hurt any more than it normally does. And it kind of always hurts. And I'm like, well, that sort of means it hurts, right? But I'm, when I'm telling you that I have rehabilitated athletes in every major professional sport with this system, does that hurt? Yes? OK, we're not going to do that. We're going to find something else. Our whole thought process, if you think about it, like our, our certified functional strength coach whole idea, our Thrive program, everything is based on this idea of progression and regression. We're going to keep regressing until we find something that doesn't hurt. And then we're going to do that. And then once we can do that, we're going to try to progress to the next thing that will be more difficult. Right? 
So how do we train the core? When do we train the core? Before our workout, during the workout, do we do it as rest for us? All of the above. We may do it for mobility and activation. So a lot of when we go downstairs in the practical, in whatever, 20 minutes from now, we'll go downstairs. What we're going to show you is what we do to warm up. But we do core training to warm up. We do motor control exercises to warm up. So we're going to show people how to bridge. We're going to show people how to do quadruped exercise. We're going to show people how to do leg lowers. We're going to show people how to do floor slides. They're all going to be warm ups. Someone else might look at them and say, oh, those are mobility exercises. Those are activation exercises. Yes. The exercises that we're going to show you in the next couple videos are all generally mobility exercises. They're all generally muscle activation exercises. And in my mind, they're also all, those are good choices for us to be using. Right? Are motor control exercises core exercise? Yes, absolutely. Are some stretches core exercises? Yes, absolutely. So you got to think about core as really smart warm up. And again, that your clients, they don't need to understand it. They just need to do it. They don't need an anatomy lesson. They don't need all kinds of crazy instruction. They just need to keep doing it, right? Core training is really a process of neuromuscular reeducation. Um, Move or not move the right joint at the right time. Shirley Sarman's quote is the right muscle moving the right joint at the right time. If we have the right muscle moving the right joint at the right time, that person will be pain free. If we don't, that person will probably over time start to display some pain. When we think about what we get focused on a lot of times in core training is we, lo or we lose focus of the fact that if I'm asking you to move your extremity, whatever it is we're doing, we might be doing wheel rollouts, ball rollouts, whatever it is, the movement of the extremity is designed to have an effect on the core. It's a perturbation. It's a way to provide additional stress to those muscles. We're trying to change the physics to make an exercise harder or to make an exercise easier. And it's not about the leg moving or the arm moving. It's what is the effect of the leg moving or the arm moving that we have to worry about. So for us, we're going to learn to stabilize against greater and greater forces. For some people, it may be just really hard to stabilize. You know, some people, are just a dead bug might be hard, just lying on their back. That might be difficult. For some people, just getting in a front plank or a side plank might be hard. That might be enough force in the beginning, right? So can we check three boxes? Like if you look at here, floor slide, mobility, activation, core. Because what am I getting? Shoulder mobility. I'm working on external rotation. I am activating my external rotators. I am stretching my internal rotators. If we think about kind of the basics of the PNF idea, I'm firing my scapula stabilizers and my external rotators. It's sending a signal to my internal rotators to relax and to lengthen. I'm combining that with breathing so that I can have a core component of that. So if you, if you look, and you'll watch, when I come back down, I'm going to inhale through my nose, and I'm going to try to get that bag to rise a little bit. When I exhale, so what I want to feel, and I love Josh's sandbag idea. He, one of his guys, Drew McConaughey, came in and did a really good in-service for us a couple of years ago with the sandbags. And I love the sandbags as reinforcement for breathing, because it's really easy now for someone to look and say, OK, when I inhale, does the bag come up a little bit? When I exhale, does the bag come down a little bit? For us, we're going to do the same thing all the time. Five second exhales. Why five second exhales? Because I want to recruit those deep abdominal muscles as stabilizers. So this is, again, the biggest change, I think, for us in core training. We don't talk about what your abdominal muscles are going to do. And people will ask this in the um, practical again, and I'll say it again. We don't tell anybody, I don't say, you know, tilt your pelvis. I don't say fire your abs. I don't say draw your abdominals. I don't say fire your transverse. All I'm going to tell somebody, all we're going to tell somebody, exhale hard. Because if I get you to exhale hard, then you are doing all of those things that I asked you to do. You are bracing. You are drawing in. You are firing your abdominals. Because we know that those muscles are involved in end stage exhalation. So while we're doing that exercise, I'm going to tell somebody, take a big Breath in through your nose, blow out hard for five seconds. And then we're going to carry that over into every exercise that we do. Same idea here. If we do leg lowers, same exact, exact thing. When both legs are up, inhale through your nose. Exhale 
hard as you lower the leg, like you are going to blow the leg down to the ground. Because I want to get abdominal firing. I want to get core stability. But we're finding the easiest way to do that is to facilitate breathing, not to try to get somebody to consciously think about what those muscles are going to do, but get somebody to subconsciously use the muscles that we want them to use. Brief lesson, functional anatomy. I can barely do a sit-up. It's because we never do sit-ups anymore. And of course, I had to get somebody to do all, all the bad exercises I did, the demos, right? I can do crunches, though. Right? But, and this, and I've gotten in a lot of trouble on Instagram in the last, whatever, two months, because I've been posting my, these ideas about bad exercise videos. There's more, yeah. I, I, I get that, I think, like, it's just dumb and dumber. But um, I like, like the leg thing, I don't get it all. Um, but when you think about this idea, functional anatomy, if you ask yourself, what do your abdominal muscles do? One, we know they assist in end-stage exhalation, so breathing is good for your abdominal muscles. Anterior abdominal muscles are anti-extension muscles. They prevent me from looking like this, right? So if I just let my back go and let my stomach stick out and don't let those muscles perform their anti-extension function, then this is what I look like, right? Their job is to maintain good posture. They never are asked to bring my rib cage down towards my pelvis. So when we talk about this, so for me now, there's two really good selling points on the no crunch idea. One, muscle never does that, so why bother, right? Why do all this work using the muscle as a flexor when it's never a flexor? I said it's a flexor twice a day. When you wake up after the morning and then when you wake up from a nap. Other than that, doesn't do it. I'm a napper, so twice. Some of you might only be once. And, and then you look at McGill's research, and McGill shows you Pig spines. If you want to blow up a pig spine, if you read his book, he shows you he's got a little pig spine and a little crunch machine. And he says, seriously, like it's honestly, the picture's in the book. And he says that after a certain number of cycles, you'll start to, to blow up lumbar discs. That was all I needed to get in the no crunch bandwagon. I'm like, okay, here's the pig spine, here's the crunch machine. This seems like a bad idea. Okay, we won't do that anymore. So we didn't. Once that, the, after the first McGill lecture, I went back, and we always have these staff meetings where everybody's like, oh, God. Because I will have heard somebody smarter than me, and I will have gone back and been like, okay, we got to scrap this, this, and this. It's like, okay, crunch, reverse crunch, um, you know, Russian twist. All, they're all out. They're like, what are we going to do? Like, don't worry, we'll, I'll show you what we're going to do. But that's all gone. Like, we're not doing that stuff anymore. And we're, we might be getting close to 20 years now. I don't know when I, the first time I heard Stuart speak was, but... I'd say it was at least 15, right? Because if we think, just so you understand this whole functional anatomy idea, if this is why you have to, one, you have to forget, you know, in the slide said, the dead person anatomy or live person anatomy. If you're like me, and most of you probably, you learned what I would call dead person anatomy. And dead person anatomy is what would happen to the cadaver lying in the lab if you could make the muscle contract, right? So if we had the cadaver in the lab and we could like drag it down and let its legs hang over and we could stimulate the quad, the leg would extend, right? We'd get this effect. Does anybody think that's what the quad does? Because it doesn't. I mean, think, when does that ever happen? Standard bad joke, one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest, right? Other than that, nobody does this ever. You know, maybe like with some people, you know, and then it's, I love people. One guy was like, in my Brazilian, Brazilian jiu-jitsu guard position, I do that. I'm like, okay, sorry, so you're the one guy. <laughs> you know, there's always like the guy on Instagram who finds like the one time when someone might actually do something dysfunctional. To, and then he can say, that's why we do leg extensions. I'm like, so you do leg extensions so you can lay on your back and kick people in jiu-jitsu. I'm like, there's probably a lot of other things you could be doing, but that's all right. Um, but the important thing to understand, if I put my foot on the ground, like I just did right now, Every muscle in my lower extremity does the same thing. This was the thing I used to love about the old NASM test. If you ever took the NASM test, and I, I think it took people a long time to figure it out, the answer to every question was the same. Every lower body anatomical question was identical. What does the gastroc do? Prevents flexion of the ankle, knee, and hip. What does the hamstring do? Prevents flexion of the ankle, knee, and hip. 
What does the glute max do? Prevents flexion of the ankle, knee, and hip. What does the quadricep do? Prevents flexion of the ankle, knee, and hip. That's, they all have the same exact action. When I push off, what do they do? They all create extension of the ankle, knee, and hip. I can remember the first time I learned functional anatomy. Gary Gray, 1994. I'm sitting there like you guys, and I'm going like, oh, shit. Like, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, I have this whole thing wrong the whole time? But again, it made so much sense. I didn't like look at Gary and go, oh, here you go, you're wrong, Gary. I was like, no, you're really smart, right? I went back, I sold my leg extension, I sold my leg curl, I sold my leg press. This was, again, probably early 90s. I sold all this stuff. I was like, great, I don't have to do any of this anymore. Because none of this stuff actually even happens. And it's the same thing with core training. Right? We waste so much time doing stupid stuff that never happens, right? Right? That's my new favorite anti-extension exercise. Really super easy to teach. It's weird because I don't have the audio plugged in, but it's coming out. But so that is what the core musculature, anterior core musculature does. It prevents extension. So if I want to do when people say, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do anti-extension work. Like TRX fallouts, or ring fallouts, or some sort of fallout, or stability ball rollouts, or even just simple planks. We're going to do anti-extension exercise, right? Yes, the same oh, sorry. Instead of, again, like when, like go through it, like when's that going to happen? And this is what I want to ask with any exercise. Ask yourself, when is this going to happen? And the answer is going to be never, right? Same thing here. Side plank, right? Side plank. That these muscles here, anti-lateral flexors. Their job is to prevent you from side bending, not to create side bend. So suddenly you realize that side plank and side plank progressions, again, if we're thinking about lateral core work, that's going to be a pretty good place to start. How about this one, right? Yeah, but how many people, right, said there's one exercise dumber than this? The two dumbbell version. I love to watch the guy do the two dumbbell one, like this, and I'm kind of like, have you ever seen a seesaw, you moron? I'm like, you know those weigh the same, right? Like nothing is happening, actually, because they weigh the same. I said, but if you ask me to come up with a really good idea to grind up your discs, I'd be like, yeah, grab some really heavy shit and just start bending sideways like that. Like, that'd probably do it. Like, just keep making that stuff squish side to side. Eventually, you'll cause some kind of problem. But you think, like, why would you do it? But we've all done it, right? I guarantee you, I guarantee you 90% of us in this room, myself included, have done that exercise. And I would guarantee 90% of us have not, or hadn't thought about the anti-lateral flexion. I can remember reading Porterfield and DeRose's book, Mechanical Low Back Pain, and reading the words anti-extension, anti-rotation, anti-lateral flexion. And again, like the Gary Gray thing, having that duh moment like, oh, anti-extension, anti-rotation, anti-lateral flexion, and being like, oh, that makes so much sense. That three words I've never seen ever in print before until the time I looked at that book. That again made me go back and think, okay, more, more exercises are gone. More things coming out than coming in, right? Same idea here in terms of anti-rotation. I don't know why some run and some don't. And this is, you know what's really funny now is that we have So some people say Paloff press. I never, you know why I never call it a Paloff press? Because John Paloff works in my facility and I refuse <laughs> to give him that much credit. So it always is an anti-rotation press, even when he is right there in front of me. But, but the basic idea of lengthening and shortening the lever and working, and it's amazing, there are people that are anti-anti-rotation. I'm like, you're actually pro-rotation when you're anti-anti-rotation, because it's a double negative. But, you know, the, the basic idea, we're not in, the, what people don't understand, we're not saying don't rotate. People are like, oh, you know what, your athletes are going to walk around like robots. I'm like, no, that's not the point. The point is we're going to train the muscles 
that are controlling, when we talk about this deliberately constrained system, we're going to strengthen the guy wires that constrain the system. Not with the intention of the system not moving, but with the intention of the constraints being better, not worse. And that's where people fail in the sort of understanding of core exercise, right? And this is my favorite. I couldn't, even, I couldn't even butcher this bad enough to like, I love people like wood choppers. Like look at like, and I, lo I love to go to like to a regular gym and just watch. I wish I could just like go hidden camera and just record like, make like a, like stupid pet videos where you could just, but you'd probably get sued. Um, but it's amazing to me. And then there are people who are always like, yeah, but I understand the anti-rotation thing, but I work with golfers. And I'm like, well, then you're an idiot because you don't even know what golf looks like and you work with golfers. That's my son. I can just picture him. But look, look at his feet. Watch any good golfer. Their feet end up facing forward. Bad golfers rotate through their lumbar spine. Good golfers go through hip internal external rotation and actually come with it. When you look at someone like Tiger, he wore out his knee with the cleats. Not, his lumbar, not as much as lumbar spine. And it's the same thing, you know, people are like, oh, but you know, what about this? Same thing, hip internal external rotation. I spent two years in Major League Baseball, hip internal external rotation. It's not lumbar rotation. It's that, that deliberately constrained system. It's the ability to transfer force from this hip to the implement that makes a difference. And you've got to transfer it through a really strong, stable, deliberately constrained system. That's important. Right? And then look at this. Is this core training? I would say yes. So there's a lot of stuff that we're going to look at and say, hey, this is all really important. Oh, we'll skip that one because it's the same. Is this core training? Yep, that's core training. This is Amit Muscle Emotion. These things are cool. If you ever get a chance to go look at any of his videos, he does a really good job of, uh, of putting, like, putting in the visuals in for you so you can see it, right? That's core training. It's just a plank, right? Push-up is just moving plank. That's core training, anti-rotation. One arm dumbbell bench, core training. Spring rows, TRX rows, core training. Right? One arm, one leg rows, core training. All these things are going to bring these pieces of the system together. So when we start thinking about beneficial core exercises, there's lots of them, right? We won't worry about joint by joint because we don't have time. But two things to avoid. Repeat flexion, we said that. Okay, We don't want to be crunching. We don't want to be doing sit-ups. The other thing, attempting to increase rotational range of motion of the lumbar spine. This is really important. I'm at about the four minute remaining mark and I got to get this in. So this is again from Porterfield to Rose, mechanical low back pain. Rather than considering the abdominals as flexors and rotators of the trunk for which they certainly have the capacity, their function might be better viewed as anti-rotators and anti-lateral flexors of the trunk. Like I said, that was just like boom, massive light bulb going off in my head like, oh yeah, I never thought about that. That book's 1998, just for the record. So it's not like that's new information. That book, that information has been out there for 20 years, right? This is Sarman, Diagnosis and Treatment of Movement Impairment Syndrome. She published in 2002. Her information's been out, I would bet, at least two decades prior to that. So this information could be 40 years old, if you're looking, right? Overall range of lumbar rotation is approximately 13 degrees. The rotation between each segment from T10 to L5 is 2 degrees. The greatest rotational range is between L5 and S1, which is 5 degrees. The thoracic spine, not the lumbar spine, should be the site of the greatest amount of rotation of the trunk. When an individual practices rotational exercises, he or she should be instructed to think about the motion occurring in the area of the chest. So for us, if we start doing things like, like chops and lifts, what are we doing? We're getting them to turn here. We're not at all, we're not encouraging anybody to rotate their lumbar spine. We're trying to teach them to move through their thoracic spine, which is where they're supposed to. This is super important. Rotation of the lumbar spine is more dangerous than beneficial. And rotation of the pelvis and lower extremities to one side while the trunk remains stable or is rotated to the other side is particularly dangerous. She doesn't just say dangerous. She says particularly dangerous, right? Watch these. And we used to do these. These were what we, these, we did these as warm-ups. We used to do them as warm-ups. And after reading this information, we scrapped all of this. Because what is that? 
right? That is that. That is rotation of the lumbar spine, right? Rotation of the pelvis and lower extremities to one side while the trunk remains stable or is rotated to the other. Particularly dangerous. Okay, and then you know, people will say the same thing, like, oh, I would do those all the time, or I like them. I don't care. I don't care that you do them all the time. I don't care that you like them. Stop. Okay, because one of the smartest physical therapists in the world said, that's particularly dangerous. Not just dangerous. She put the word particularly in front of dangerous. So you can keep doing it, which is fine, and you can keep hurting people. I stopped. You know what else stopped when I stopped? A lot of my back pain. <laughs> we stopped, right? We never, like, we never do anything that looks like that stuff ever. So it's really, uh, sorry. Oh, and this, this is another, this is one of my favorites, and I got one minute. All right. Oh. This is, this is far as the Forrest Gump of abs, right? Stupid is as stupid does. Like, I look at, okay, when the hell would anything, you know, some guy, oh, pole vaulting. I was like, literally, like, if I put it up on the internet, someone will literally, within 30 seconds, send me the one thing that might actually involve doing something that stupid. So if you're training pole vaulters, yes, toes to the bar is going to be a good exercise for you. If you don't, which I think is the majority of us in here, I'm not sure, but I don't know how many pole vault trainers there are in the room. But in general, that's just stupid. Okay, anything, any long lever hip flexion is stupid. Because you don't do long lever hip flexion. Maybe again, punter, there's some people, unilateral. But in general, this stuff doesn't happen. We need to think about this idea of why. And then the why should start to drive us towards the how and towards the what. But all this stuff that we talked about here, the, these ideas of anti-rotation, anti-lateral flexion, all these things, that's all the why. And if you have your why in order, then it's really easy to come up with a, a what menu. And when you come up with a what menu, then we can spend a lot of time working on the how menu. We're going to go downstairs, and I'm actually two minutes over, I think. Um, we're going to go downstairs, and I won't, I'm not going to, Chris had said questions in the hall. I won't take questions in the hall because mine are back to back. I will take questions in the practical room before we start. So if you want to do that. But thank you very much for listening. I hope you come downstairs. <laughs>